Welcome, I'm Gerald Gronwald. I'm director of the Energy and Environmental Research Center. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Marine Fisheries Service, and the ERC are pleased to present this production. The documentary you are about to see explores the critical question, how much fish should we eat? Humankind has relied on fish for food since the dawn of time. Seafood is an important source of essential nutrients for our brains, our hearts, and our immune systems. These nutrients are also particularly critical for fetal and infant development. In recent years, there have been concerns about mercury in fish. People are understandably worried about eating fish. Because of those worries, people run the risk of missing out on the important nutrients that ocean fish and other seafood provide. This program presents key information to evaluate the role of seafood in our diets and clarifies the risk of mercury in fish consumption. Mercury contamination in fish is largely misunderstood and overstated. Constituents in the environment worldwide provide a natural buffer to the potential negative impacts of mercury. This story illustrates how scientists continually work together to learn about our environment and its effects on our health. Folklore has it that fish is brain food. Science is confirming this. We wish to thank the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service and Prairie Public Broadcasting for their financial support in making this program possible. We hope you'll find this documentary informative and thank you for watching. Ocean fish are almost an ideal nutrient package for, for pregnancy and breastfeeding. Women who ate more fish during pregnancy had babies that had better scores on tests of development at six months and at three years. Since seafood is so important for later health, I think it's very important for children and young adults to eat seafood to establish that, that healthy dietary pattern at a, at a young age. We should not consider fish as a mercury delivery system. That's not what it is. It's a package of nutrients. We need to look at those nutrients and see it in its entirety. Funding provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The National Marine Fisheries Service, Pacific Islands Regional Office, and the members of Prairie Public. Is it safe for pregnant and nursing women to eat fish? My doctor told me to eat salmon for my heart. I'm worried that if I eat fish, the mercury could hurt my baby. Well, how much fish is safe to eat? Is any fish safe to eat? Fish. What to eat and how much has left everyone with more questions than answers. Is the answer different for children than for adults? How about women who are pregnant or nursing? What is the story when it comes to eating fish? We all know that pregnant women receive lots of warnings about what to do to protect their developing babies. Exercise, take vitamins, avoid alcohol and smoking. And mothers want to eat foods that are good for baby. You only get one chance to develop a brain, and if, if the brain has not uh, been developed in an optimal way, then that's what you're stuck with the rest of your life. Medical researchers have learned that omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA, are critical for brain development. The brain is made of fats and lipids, and some of these fats and lipids can only be obtained from the diet, especially DHA, one of the omega-3 fatty acids, so if you don't eat enough omega-3 fatty acids, it has a profound impact because you literally can't make a new brain without adequate amounts of DHA. Sort of like building a house, you can't do it without concrete and two by fours. And if it's not there, if it's not present in the diet, the neurons don't form correctly and they don't function correctly. Omega-3 fatty acids are found in minor sources in plants, and so flaxseed and walnuts are, and soybeans are some sources. But the long-chain omega-3s are really only found in shellfish and fish. And omega-3 fatty acids can't be made by humans to any appreciable extent. And so really to get the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids in the body, you have to eat seafood. 
Not having enough seafood in the diet could have major impacts on the developing brain, both in the womb and during infancy. DHA is particularly important for the structure and function of the brain and the eye, the neurologic tissues, and it appears that the great majority of the DHA that's in the brain and the eye is taken up in the third trimester of pregnancy and the first year or two of life. Some experts recommend that women during pregnancy try to get in about 200 milligrams of DHA a day. On average, in the U.S., pregnant women are getting around 80 milligrams of DHA a day. That would be in contrast to uh, women in Norway, for example, that consume about 300 milligrams. In Japan, even higher. And we have one of the lowest DHA uh, levels in human milk in the world. The Sudan in Africa is below us. Vegan vegetarians are lower, but we're in comparison to some very severely deprived groups. Okay, you're missing something here. Check that out. Such low levels are of concern because the DHA found in shellfish and fish helps young brains develop as measured by everything, from their attention span to IQ scores. The story that is well developed for the last 30 years on omega-3 fatty acids and DHA in particular is related to neural development, to visual development. But even recently, we're finding that DHA is affecting the developing autonomic nervous system and the developing immune system. Jack, put it on. So far, the story is if you eat more DHA, there's benefits for all the systems. But this story isn't reaching the public. Instead of DHA and other critical nutrients that fish provide, people are hearing about mercury. We just finished some focus groups among women about their fish consumption and what they had heard and been told, and it was a bit surprising. Most of the women who were all pregnant had received some information about the Federal Mercury Advisory, either a handout or a conversation with a clinician about fish and mercury. Mercury is bad for the brain, and they should avoid fish containing mercury, and they got a list. None of them got any advice about the fact that fish contains beneficial nutrients. Some of them knew that, but none of them received advice, and none of them were told to eat fish during pregnancy. And the women said that if someone had told them to eat fish, they might actually eat more fish. Pregnant women aren't the only group who are missing the message that eating ocean fish is good for health. Many people don't recognize that the current health advisory from the uh, federal government over fish consumption is directed towards pregnant women. So we'll have um, um, an 80-year-old man raise his hand and says, well, do I really have to limit my sashimi consumption because of mercury? That's crazy. I've been eating fish for all my life. I said, sir, you, the likelihood of you getting pregnant at this point is about like this. Many analyses have shown that if the general population you know, lowered their fish intake by even a small amount because of concern, we'd have many thousands of more heart disease deaths. And so, you know, we don't want that focused advisory, which is really for a focused population, to scare everyone else away from eating fish. Concern about mercury in our diet stems from two mercury poisonings that devastated local populations. The first was in Japan. Fish from the waters of Minamata Bay had fed local residents for centuries. But in the 1950s, industrial contamination of the fish led to tragedy. The Minamata experience was a poisoning. This was a result of a chemical manufacturing plant pouring effluent into the Minamata Bay. The effluent contained high concentrations of methylmercury. The fish were poisoned, and the people who ate the fish were also poisoned. Levels of mercury in the fish and in the hair of the humans that were poisoned were extremely high, have never been seen again, ever, anywhere. When the Minamata outbreak took place in the middle 1950s, a large number of people were poisoned, but one of the issues was the fact that mothers who consumed the contaminated uh, fish uh, could uh, have minimal or no symptoms, and the infants could be damaged rather severely with uh, cerebral palsy. In the 1970s, wheat seed treated with mercury fungicide was sent to famine-ravaged Iraq. But instead of planting the seeds, farmers used the grain to feed their starving families. 
These tragic poisonings in Japan and Iraq showed that brain damage in children could occur with high mercury exposure, hundreds of times higher than in a normal diet. Fish naturally contain some mercury, which they get from the aquatic environment. This is because the mercury has been converted to a form that is easily digested and absorbed by living tissue, from tiny plankton to great white sharks. As larger fish eat smaller fish, the mercury accumulates in their muscle tissues. When we eat fish, we take in the mercury from the fish and store some of it in our hair, muscle, and other tissues, and pregnant women pass it along to their babies. Concerned that pregnant women eat enough fish to provide DHA, but still protect developing brains, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency issued a joint fish consumption advisory in 2004 for commercial fish. Our advisory is specifically addressed to women who are pregnant and to children. The focus of our advisory was on the consumption of fish, but primarily on four species of fish we were concerned about, and that is shark, swordfish, tilefish, and king mackerel. And on the basis of our assessment, we concluded that pregnant women should not eat these species. As a matter of prudence, we also recommended that children not eat these species. And then we gave some further advice about uh, the fact that fish is an important part of the diet, that there are benefits associated with eating fish, and that for women who are pregnant, we recommended the inclusion of about 12 ounces of fish on a weekly basis. It does not address the issue of exposure to the rest of the population. And the reason is because of what we know from the scientific literature in terms of human health effects. Studies have been documenting diet and child development in fish eating populations for many years. These studies have an interesting and sometimes puzzling story. If you look around the world, the people who consume the largest amounts of fish are in Japan, and Seychelles is very high too, and then island nations around the world similarly. In fact, there are more than one billion people who depend on fish for nutrition every day. In the 1980s, teams of researchers set out to find what level of mercury exposure from normal seafood could cause harm to children. One team traveled to the Indian Ocean, to the fish-eating population of the Seychelles Islands. People in the Seychelles eat a lot of fish. At the time we started the main study in 1989, uh, the average uh, consumption was 11 fish meals per week. That's roughly 10 times higher than the U.S. During this same period, another team of researchers headed to the Faroe Islands. It's a unique community where they eat from the very, very top of the marine food chain. Some people just eat cod and salmon and uh, have relatively low mercury exposures, and some people would eat a lot of pilot whale along with fish and have much higher mercury exposures. When we looked at the results at age seven, we saw a very clear deficits that were associated with their prenatal uh, mercury exposure, that is from the mother's diet during pregnancy. What determines the child's deficits is the mother's mercury exposure during pregnancy. Our research in the Pharos has had um, a, a very clear impact because uh, the authorities have recommended that the population abstain from eating pilot whale. And we have seen mercury concentrations plummeting, especially in pregnant women. They essentially don't eat pilot whale anymore. In the Seychelles Islands, the story wasn't so clear. When we first started the study, we did not know what to expect. Most of us thought that we were going to immediately discover an adverse association between prenatal mercury levels in the maternal hair and the very first measures of child development. So at six months, we didn't find any adverse association. We didn't find any association at all. So we kept looking, thinking that it might emerge over time. We looked at 19 months, we looked at 29 months, still no adverse association. 
but at 66 months of age, we started seeing evidence of beneficial, in quotes, associations between maternal hair mercury and developmental outcomes, and we have continued to find them. This is probably linked to nutrients in the fish that are ingested at the same time as the mercury is. Considering the newest research results on omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA, researchers in the Seychelles decided to broaden their studies to look at the whole picture of a fish-based diet. As we looked at our data, it became increasingly apparent to us that although we were not finding uh, anything uh, directly adverse with the mercury exposure, fish consumption itself proposed a lot of benefits. And one of the hypotheses that we raised in the 1990s was that perhaps there was something else that was either interfering with it or that was so beneficial that it overrode any possible adverse effect of mercury. The Seychelles research was published. The results suggested that even pregnant women and young children should not be scared away from eating fish. Essentially what we found was that there were beneficial effects on the children's developmental testing from the long-chain fatty acids, specifically omega-3s, and that there were slightly adverse effects from the methylmercury, but they more than balanced each other out. So, developmentally speaking, eating ocean fish is good for babies. In fact, medical research indicates that ocean fish is good for everyone. The omega-3 fatty acid DHA is essential for children, but is also important for adults. DHA and another omega-3 fatty acid, EPA, are critical for our cardiovascular system. Coronary heart disease is the leading killer of men and women in this country and in almost every country in the world. And nutrition has uh, such an important effect on cardiovascular disease. And among nutritional factors, omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, have among the most powerful beneficial effects for prevention of cardiovascular disease. In populations where more fish is eaten, and that includes Northern Europe, that includes the Mediterranean area, Japan and the shoreline of Asia, there are different positive trends higher omega-3s, the things that go along with the fish consumption, there's less diabetes, there's less depression, there's less heart attacks, there's less stroke. National average might be 16 pounds of mixed seafood per year per person. The best estimate is the state of Hawaii consumes per capita on average uh, at least three times the national average. So that was up to three meals a week. People in the United States eat far fewer fish meals than the medical community recommends, and it's having an impact. In Boston, Massachusetts, Project Viva followed 2,000 women through pregnancy and assessed the development of their children. The women in Project Viva were eating on average about one fish meal a week or less, so about 10% or fewer of the women were eating more than two weekly fish servings, and about 10%, I think, never ate fish. The women who ate more fish during pregnancy had babies that had better scores on tests of development at six months and at three years. The women who ate more fish during pregnancy also had higher mercury levels in their blood and hair, but despite that, the overall effect of fish consumption was that a benefit. These findings were backed up by a much larger study in Great Britain. One of the biggest studies was the study in a population of mothers and children in the UK called the ALSPAC study, in which they looked at maternal fish consumption during pregnancy and child development through the school years. And the ALSPAC study had data on 14,500 pregnancies and the amounts of seafood intake that the mothers ate during pregnancy. So we decided to evaluate the data to test the letter of the 2004 EPA and FDA advisory. Now that advisory advises women to eat no more than 12 ounces of seafood per week and to avoid certain species. So we divided the group of women at Alsbach into those that ate no seafood, those that ate some seafood but didn't cross the limit, and those who ate more than 12 ounces per week. And we asked which of those three groups had children that did the best. Does a diet deficient in seafood during pregnancy in the mom have long-term results of harm for the children when they were eight years of age. 
and they found that on several of the outcomes they tested, including components of IQ and school performance, that the kids of mothers who ate more than two weekly fish servings, which is the limit currently recommended by the federal government, those kids had better developmental outcomes in the school years. And when they ate less than 12 ounces a week, it was associated with nearly a doubling of the risk that the children would have low verbal IQ. Now we also found that children had greater social problems and peer problems when their mothers did not eat sufficient seafood. That is, they followed the advisory. And the children also had problems with fine motor control and other indicators of neural development. So the, the reviewers and the editors of The Lancet, when we published the paper, made us add the words that following the seafood advisory was detrimental. They did not have information on mercury in that study, although it is likely that most of the moms in that cohort were not eating fish that was high in mercury. The study in the Faroe Islands subsequently went back and looked at fish consumption in their cohort, and they found that the mothers who ate more fish had higher mercury levels, but the fish consumption was beneficial for the child outcome, so very similar to our study results. Researchers were seeing the importance of eating fish for the healthy development of children. Women in the Seychelles ate 12 ocean fish meals per week on average, but the trace amounts of mercury in the fish didn't seem to be harming their children. Children in the Faroe Islands did seem to have effects from mercury, but most of the mercury in their mother's diets came from eating the mammal pilot whale, not fish. Why would that matter? Biochemists and biologists think it might be the presence of another beneficial nutrient in fish, the element selenium. It was first recognized that selenium protected against mercury toxicity. This was back in 1967 when they did an animal study where they found that feeding animals a amount of mercury that would kill them could be completely prevented if they were just given a similar amount of selenium. At that time, researchers only understood that high levels of selenium were toxic to humans. Since then, Scientists have discovered that selenium is a nutrient required for health. Many important processes in the body need selenium to work properly. We know selenium is important for brain development from studies in which the deletion of selenium transport to the brain results in severe neurological developmental problems. In fact, not having enough selenium contributes to many neurological conditions, including mental retardation. But that's not all. Selenium proteins sequester the heavy metals such as mercury, cadmium, and lead and prevent the metals from getting into the cells or, or causing the damage that they would normally cause. There's damage that can occur from the metals reacting with various other compounds. But in addition, one of the consequences of, of heavy metals is that it takes selenium away from where it's needed. Once mercury and selenium bump into each other, they actually form a chemical bond with one another that will not break. Selenium is the essential molecule that the body needs. Mercury binds the selenium, taking it out of place so that it can't perform its essential functions. All of the characteristic signs and symptoms of mercury toxicity line up exactly with what we would expect in an organism with selenium deficiency. Where do we get selenium in our diet? The USDA did a study of selenium sources in the American diet. Out of 1,100 foods that were assayed, they found that 17 of the top 25 sources of selenium in the American diet are ocean fish. The researchers hypothesized that fish containing more selenium than mercury could provide enough selenium to bind with the mercury and still meet the body's needs. Researchers tested this idea in laboratory studies. We gave the selenium in the form of ocean fish. So we had to get rid of any excess omega-3s or vitamin D, so it's only gonna be the protein, which is where the selenium resides. We were still feeding huge amounts of mercury, amounts that would otherwise eventually be lethal to the animals. The animals that we gave fish protein, the selenium from the protein, offset the mercury binding and the animals maintained health, normal growth, no neurofunctional consequences.
In contrast, the rats that were not fed ocean fish grew poorly and showed signs of neurological damage within a few weeks. Based on theirs and the findings of other groups, the researchers extrapolated their results to humans. So we're feeling fairly confident now that ocean fish consumption prevents rather than contributes to causing mercury toxicity. Some people say, oh yes, but an animal model is not the same as a human. However, it's very important for everyone to recognize that all forms of life that have brains have selenium-dependent enzymes that protect their brains. It doesn't matter if you're a human or a rat. If you don't have selenium-dependent enzymes, you are not going to live very long. But what about the studies that suggested harm from mercury from eating normal amounts of seafood? Does the selenium explanation fit the findings of the Faroe Island study that showed harm from eating seafood? The studies on which the original recommendations are based are studies in which the primary source of, of, of mercury in the diet was from pilot whale, which has very low levels of selenium. They contain far more mercury than selenium. Ocean fish are completely different than that. Most varieties of ocean fish that people consider seafoods contain many times more selenium than mercury. Ocean fish are enriched in selenium because the oceans have been accumulating it for millions of years. But what about freshwater fish from lakes and rivers? Selenium is not present in all freshwater fish. It, it's actually a function of the local geography and what it, what's in the minerals in the land. The biggest difference that I see from the literature and our results is that the marine fish have a much higher selenium concentration relative to mercury than do the freshwater fish. A U.S. Environmental Protection Agency research team looked at how safe the fish were based on two methods. One method looks only at the level of mercury in fish. The second method compares the level of mercury to the level of selenium. So if we use only the mercury criterion to evaluate the condition of the fish that we've caught, we see 12% of those fish that exceed that mercury criterion. This would result in most cases in states issuing uh, warnings against eating these fish. On the other hand, if we use the selenium to mercury assessment approach, only 2.5% of the fish would fall into a concern for consumption. Just like in the oceans, those fish happen to be top-level predators, large, older fish that have been eating other fish for years, concentrating mercury in their flesh. The takeaway message from this is that there is a vast difference between evaluating the fish based on mercury alone versus using the selenium mercury assessment approach. And then uh, freshwater fish may be susceptible to getting increased amounts of uh, different kinds of uh, toxicants, and that would certainly include mercury. So you need to be aware of your local fish advisories in terms of uh, nutrition during a pregnancy. Every state publishes local advisories for the fish you can catch yourself. So what does the average consumer need to know when they go to the store or restaurant? The average fish consumer who's buying fish in the grocery store just wants to know what's safe. When we conducted these focus groups with pregnant women, they follow the cautionary principle often. If there's any risk, I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, but not recognizing because no one had told them that there was risk to eating no fish as well. Fish should be a part of a very diet uh, because there are essential nutrients in fish. But make sure that the fish is low in mercury. Fish low in mercury are perfect for pregnant and nursing moms. As long as pregnant women stay away from the four fish listed in the advisory, they can safely eat 12 ounces per week of any fish from the store for the benefit of their developing baby. For everyone else... I think it's very important to be very clear that for adults, there are actually no recommendations to avoid uh, fish that contain you know, moderate amounts of mercury or, or even other, other contaminants. And so if somebody eats commercially purchased fish in the store and just eats a variety of fish, uh, they don't need to worry about uh, the, the very low levels of, of toxins that are in those fish. 
generally dark and oily fish are the richest in omega-3 fatty acids, and as a total nutrient package, fish like sardines are, are lovely, containing vitamin D and calcium and other nutrients, but also salmon and tuna are very rich sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Whitefish are also useful. Shellfish and shrimp are also useful. In general, I advise people to, to shift towards a fish diet because nobody can eat just dark and oily fish every day. And you need variety, and a variety will give you a very good balance of the nutrients. The critical issue is to eat that two to three times a week. Over a billion people around the world benefit from eating a diet rich in fish. When pregnant women eat fish, they supply the critical building blocks for the eyes and brains of their babies. When children and adults eat fish, they get the benefits for their heart and immune systems. Ocean fish actually uh, are, are almost an ideal nutrient package for, for a pregnancy and breastfeeding because it contains high quality protein, omega-3 fatty acids, it contains micronutrients as well as minerals and vitamins. Women in the United States who choose not to consume fish during pregnancy or who are not consuming some kind of supplement of DHA are taking a risk for the development of their infant. They may be creating a risk for themselves as well. There are certainly benefits to maternal nutrition, and that includes cardiovascular uh, health, prevention of heart disease, coronary artery disease, a stroke. During adult life, you know, seafood is, is probably the single most important food you can eat for cardiovascular health, just you know, gram for gram, calorie for calorie, because it reduces the risk of dying from heart disease, which is the number one cause of death in, in men and women by about a third. Dietary habits established you know, during childhood persist throughout life. And so since seafood is so important for later health, I think it's very important for children and young adults to eat seafood to establish that healthy dietary pattern at a young age. The episode in Minamata, the episode in Iraq, I mean, those were overt poisonings. On the other side, are all of the epidemiological studies that look at low-level exposure, and there's such a gap between those. At this point in time, we don't have any very good evidence that the levels that you get from consuming fish actually cause adverse effects from mercury exposure. And we have really quite good evidence these days that fish consumption is important to development of the brain in children. Funding provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Marine Fisheries Service, Pacific Islands Regional Office, and the members of Prairie Public.